Okay, welcome everybody, and welcome to a brand new series. This series is titled From Creation to the Flood, and we're very, very fortunate to be in the presence of Rabbi Dr. David Harbeta. He teaches the big ideas of Jewish thought at different Jewish Jerusalem seminaries. He also teaches BA and MA level courses on the philosophy of education and on Jewish identity at Herzog College and Jewish thought at the Gun Nachum High School in Rishon. Rabbi Harbeta received his PhD in education from the University of Haifa and his smicha from Rabbi Zaman Nehemiah Goldberg in Jerusalem. And he lives with his family in Efrat. Rabbi Dr. Harbeta, it is a pleasure to have you on with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your patience in what it took to get us to this point. And we are so excited to learn from you and with you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Fishman. Nice to meet you, Joe, Vera, and Terry. Look forward to seeing your faces. Now I see Vera's face. Hopefully we'll see Terry's face soon. Hi, Terry. Um, uh, so this was meant to be um, a an opportunity for me to travel the U.S. and Canada on a book tour to promote my book that just came out. It's called In the Beginnings, Discovering the Two Worldviews Hidden Within Genesis 1 through 11. It came out a few months ago. It's available on Amazon. Uh, it's available at select bookstores. It got a wonderful review in the Jerusalem Post and the Jerusalem Report recently. And unfortunately, this book tour was canceled and very disappointing, but of course, pales in comparison to the larger stuff that we're dealing with here in Israel. Um, but I'm very excited to have the opportunity to share some of my Torah um, with you here online. And <laughs> again, I thank Rabbi Fishman for the opportunity to do so. So without further ado, I would like to begin. All right. Are we ready? Now, you, I, um, I had asked Rabbi Fishman to ask you to have a Sefer Brishit, a book of Genesis, either in Hebrew or in English, preferably both. Um, available to you because we're going to be doing some text study. And uh, so if you don't have one in front of you, I suggest you get one um, so that we can begin our study. I see that Terry just got up to get one. So we'll pause for a second. Vera is going to get one too. And then we will begin. By the way, you're muted, but this is meant to be interactive. I'm going to ask you questions as we go along. And I would welcome your responses. If you don't respond, then I'll just give away the answers as we move along. But I would certainly encourage you to respond on your own and make this more of an interactive kind of learning. Okay, we'll just wait a moment for Terry and Vera to return with their books so we uh, can actually learn together. Vera, give her a few more seconds. Or Breshit or, or yes, Noah. Breshit, Breshit, the very beginning of the Torah, very, very beginning of the Torah. Okay. Yes. And so I want to, I want to, by way of introduction, I simply want to say, I want to ask you the following question. Um, how many people in the world would you say care about the Bible on some level? Let's think for a second. You don't actually have to answer that, but think for a second. How many people in the world care about the Bible? Well, I would have to say pretty much all Christians, which are constitute about 2.5 billion people, 15 million Jews, and some Muslims. So I would say we're talking about more than a third of the world um, has some kind of relationship with the Bible. Now, um, and how many of these people at least have in theory, but how many of these 3 billion people, let's say, let's say 2.5 plus billion people have actually studied anything about the Bible? Let's say half. Okay, so let's assume that between a billion and a billion and a half have learned anything, something about the Bible. That's still a lot. That's a lot of people. Now, if you think about how many people in history have encountered the Bible, right, of these Christians and Jews and some Muslims over the course of the last 2,000 years or so, 2,000 plus years since the Bible, and when I'm referring to the Bible, I'm referring to the Hebrew Bible, it's been around, that's well over 2,000 years. And so we're talking about billions of people who have some basic familiarity, some encounter with the Bible, okay? Now, if you were to talk about what are the most well-known stories of the Bible, the well, most well-known stories of the Bible, 
I think you'd have to agree, right, that the story of creation in six days and the story of the Garden of Eden, Gan Eden, the story of Gan Eden, Gan Eden and Adam and Eve, right, and the apple, whatever it is that they ate, right, and the story of Cain and Abel, the story of the flood. If you had, if you had to list the top ten stories with even someone with a very, right, limited familiarity with the Bible, these would these stories would feature among the top, almost certainly feature among the top ten. Okay, now why am I telling you this? Is because the billions of people that have some kind of awareness, exposure to these basic stories, among these billions of people over the years that have encountered these stories in some level, how many people realize or have realized that the two first stories in the Bible contradict one another in the most fundamental ways? The two first stories in the Bible, namely, the story of creation in six days and the story that follows wait chapter one of creation of, of the of Genesis is the story of creation and chapter two is the story of um, the Garden of Eden and and Adam and Eve these are the two first stories in the Bible again where which anyone has has a, any rudimentary familiarity with the Bible would have known would know these stories and yet, Hardly, or or maybe a tiny, tiny percentage of these people are aware that these stories completely contradict each other in virtually every way. Now you're going to say, "What am I talking about?" So I'm going to let's do this together. Let's do this together to, to see what I'm talking about. Okay. So let us just review for a moment, and you can you can skim the text to see. Um, I assume I assume that. That all of you, all three of you, and whoever else listens to this class at a future date, um, because you're in this, you're in this pro learning program. I am fairly certain that all of you have some rudimentary familiarity with the Bible, and so let's just review things that you are some familiar with to some extent. Right? Creation of the world in six days. By the way, you could chime in at any point if you'd like. To. Okay, creation of the world in six days. That's Genesis chapter one. Okay, now let's just review again. This is review, I assume, for most of you. And if there's some by some chance some of you are not familiar with, let's just go over this because it's important as we develop the thesis. Day number one, what does God create on day number one? Anybody want to chime in? What is the what is the created on day number one? Light, correct, right? There was there was darkness, the world's full of nights, and and God then created right light. And there was light, and now they're able to distinguish between day uh, between light and darkness. Okay, day number one. Day number two, right? What does God do on day number two? Help me out here again. If you wish to participate, welcome your input. Waters, waters. What? I'm sorry, they said it again. Separate, separate the waters water from above. The world yeah. before it got God um, intervened as a world filled with some massive water, and then what God did in day day number two is he separates. The water from above, the water below. Don't ask me about science. I don't want to get into that. I'm just talking the literal reading of the text. And now we have water that's above. So like that becomes the expanse. It's called the sky. And and then uh, that's the second day. So now the waters are separated. Day number three. Okay, what's day number three? Anybody? Earth. 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 Right. So God takes he now we have water below, right? The water. Below is now separated between dry, between the water and, and dry land. In other words, you have seas, as opposed to one giant mass of water uh, underneath the sky. You now have water that's located, right, limited to oceans, and now we have space for dry land. And then the second part of day three, the second part of day three, after God creates dry land, what does he then do in day three, in the second half of day three? All right. Uh, let the earth sprout vegetation. Correct. Beautiful. So now we have vegetation on earth, seed bearing plants, fruit, fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with seed. I'm reading the JPS translation. So if it's a little bit different from your translation, then you should know where I'm reading from. Okay. So now day number three, we have water and dry land and the dry land, right, bears fruit, um, 
plants, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, day number four. What's day number four? The stars. The stars, exactly. We have the stars to separate day from night. We have the, the earth, the, right? The sun, the moon, and the stars. So now we have we're going back to the upper spheres, right? If day three focused on what goes on on Earth, now we're going back up to oh, heaven yeah. and see that there's a distinction between, right? In other words, now we have planets, um, uh, st uh, stars, and the sun and the moon to provide light on Earth, etc. Okay, day number five. What's day number five? Help me out here. Verse 20. Even creatures. Animals, I guess. Which creatures are created on day number five? Marine and bird life. Huh? I'm sorry? Uh, so we're talking about marine and bird life. Aren't correct, we? correct. So now we have the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky. That's mm -hmm. day number four. What's day, ah, I'm sorry, that's, yeah, I'm sorry. that's day, day number five, my mistake. Day number five. What's day number six? The bending of the beast of the land. I'm sorry? Day number six is? More animals. So animal and creepy. Land and animals. Creepy. Land animals. And what's the final creation after the land animals? It's that, the seventh day of Sabbath. No, before the seventh day. We forgot something very important here. Sixth day. The, on the sixth day after the animal, well, land animals are created. You forgot some something very important here. It was good. I don't know. No, what else was created on the sixth day? Just Very animals. important. What? Just animals creeping no. and the land of the land, each according to its kind. Guys, 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 take a look at verse 26, 27, 28. Oh. 26, oh, I didn't turn the page. Sorry. Verses 26, 27, 28. Man. Six, Fish. Harry, what do you say? People, human. People, the human being, human beings, okay? Yeah. We were created in the sixth, sixth day after the land animals. And of course, Joe, as you said correctly, the seventh day, which is the beginning of chapter two, is the Sabbath, okay? So I just summarized that. Now, so that's an account of creation according to chapter one and the beginning of chapter two. So let's focus on one thing at a time. Okay, so according to this, Vegetation and fruit. Okay, what days were vegetation and fruit? Let's just this. This is a review. What day was vegetation and fruit created? This is a little review based on what we just said. Go back. Vegetation. Three. What? Day three. Day three. Thank you, Terry. Okay. Now I want to. I want to read the beginning of chapter two, and I want to read verse five of chapter two. Actually, let's start with verse four. Let's read together. Yeah. Okay, verse four of chapter two. We'll read it in Hebrew and then immediately in English. So follow with me. Ava, are you with me? Chapter two, verse four. Ava, if you don't have the Hebrew, trust me, I'll translate. Such is the story of heaven and earth when they were created. When the Lord God made earth and heaven, verse five, when no shrub of the field was yet on earth, and no grasses of the field had yet sprouted, because the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the soil. Let's just understand. The Torah is describing here, at this stage, we have here, there's no shrub on the field, and no, there's no shrubs and no grasses. Why? Because there was no rain and no there was no human being to till the soil. So let's continue reading. Chapter, verse 6. But a flow would well up from the ground and water the whole surface of the earth. Verse 7. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth. He blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Okay. So let me ask you the following question. So now, who was the first thing to be created? Who was the first to be created? Uh, his, body from, his body from the dust. I'm sorry? 
the his fish body from the earth and his soul from the spirit. I, I'm sorry. What we just bet there was there was no there was no vegetation on the earth, right? There was no vegetation on the earth. So therefore, uh, God created the human being. And what's the next, right? The next verse, v verse eight. Right, Vayita Adonai Elohim Gan Beedem Miketem Vayasem Shameta Adam Yetzel Yetzal Asher Yetzal Vayatzmach Adonai Elohim Min Haadama Ko Etz Nechmad Demare VeTov LeMaachal VeEtz Achayim BeTochagan VeEtz Adat Tovara. Let me translate verses eight and nine. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and placed there the man whom He had formed. And from the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that was pleasing to the sight and good for food with the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and bad. So I want to talk about the sequence here. According to the, what did we just learn? At what stage did God create, according to this account in chapter two, at what stage did God create trees? Maybe the seeds were there when we say in day third, all the seeds were there, but there was no rain on people. And no, no, then no, no, they no, no, came no. after. I'm asking no. you to read chapter two separate from chapter one. I don't want you to read chapter two in light of chapter one. I want you to read chapter two as it's an independent unit. And chapter two tells us, I want you to forget chapter one, because chapter two is an independent unit, as I will as I will soon demonstrate. It says that there was no nothing growing on the world, right? And not only that, nothing could grow because there was no rain and no human being to cultivate. So what does then God do? He then he creates, creates the human. He creates the human being. And after he creates the human being, then what does he do? He, he from starts. the ground, causes to, to, to grow every tree that was pleasing. When were the trees created according to this account? Prior, prior or subsequent to the human beings being created? What's the after answer? The after. Mm -hmm. Guys, please remember here. In the chapter one, in the first account of creation that we saw a few minutes ago, we said that that trees, plant, plants, right, were created on the third day prior to the human being who was created at the second half of the sixth day, which means the sequence in chapter one is vegetation, trees, and only later the human being. But here in this account, we have a human being created before there was any vegetation on earth. In fact, the human being was created to enable things to grow on earth. There was nothing growing. And after, so we have here a discrepancy between chapter one that talks about the vegetation, trees, the ground, right, plants existing prior to the creation of the human being. But according to chapter two, the verses that we just read, the human being was created first and only subsequently were the trees created. So we have already one discrepancy or contradiction between the ver the account of creation in chapter one and the account of creation in chapter two. Are you with me? Are you following? But that's only one discrepancy. But let's move on. But, I'm sorry? Let's, let's talk about the animals. Okay. When were the animals created? Back, let's remember Genesis chapter number one. We said it a few minutes ago. What what was created? When were the animals created? What days were the animals created according to chapter one? Yeah. Okay, you tell me. So answer the question. Day You're right. five. Day five and Terry and, and six. six. Again, after the human being or before the human being? Before. Before the human. Now I'd like to go over to chapter two and I want to skip. I want to skip to verse 18, chapter 2, verse 18. And I want to read this together with you. Okay, mm -hmm. chapter 2, verse 18. Vayomer Adonai Elohim, lotov heyot adam levado, eselo ezel kenado. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a fitting helper for him. Now, if you didn't read the text, if you didn't read the text, what would you say is the next thing that happens? Eve. Yes, you would say that the next thing that happens is that God creates the woman. But you would be wrong, because let's read the text. Verse 19. Okay. Translation. 
And the Lord God formed out of the earth all the wild beasts and all the birds of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that would be its name. And the man gave name to all the cattle and the birds of the sky and to all the wild beasts. But for Adam, no fitting helper was found. Hold on, guys. What was created after the Torah declares that the human being or God recognizes that the human being is alone and he wants to create a fitting helper for him? What's the next thing that happens? Not the creation of Eve. Adam has to have companionship. Yes. And challenge that is present in good marriages. No, what? where does the marriage? What does the text tell us? What's the next thing that's created after God recognizes the human being is alone? All the animals and vegetation. And an all animals. Not vegetation. The animal, no, no, no. the animals. The animals no. created. The animals are created as an attempt to resolve the man's loneliness. loneliness. Now, this is shocking to many people. Shocking. But it is, in fact, what the text says. The text says that God had a notion that the human being's loneliness would be alleviated by the creation of animals. And can, by the way, it's only when the human being looked around at all the animals, right, and found no fitting helper, only at that point, in verse 21, does it say, etc., etc., et only then... Wait, the Lord God cast a deep sleep upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed it, and they created the woman. It's only when the animals were not an adequate solution did God decide to create the woman. Okay, now let's recall here. The animals then, according to this text, were this text that we just read, were created prior to the human being or after the human being? After, after. After, unquestionably. According to the text that we just read, the human being was created first, and it was in response to his loneliness that God created animals. But in chapter one of Genesis, we said, and you repeated correctly, that according to chapter one, the animals were created on days five and six prior to the human being. So this is a major discrepancy. Chapter one has the animals created prior to the human being. But chapter two has the human, the animals created after the human being and in response to the human being, in response to his state of loneliness. Discrepancy number two. Tell me if you have any questions about what we said so far. Because if you don't, we'll continue. Joe, are you okay? Did you follow what I'm saying here? Well, what, it, what my text seems to say is that man uh, was created, then woman, a companion, and then animals. Am I wrong? No, no. Man, woman doesn't exist yet. Man was created alone, and in response to his loneliness, that's what the text tells us. The text tells us in verse 18 that God, after creating the man, realized that he was alone or lonely, and therefore he decided to pro solve this loneliness. But before he created the woman, he created the animals which means that the animals were created after the human being and in response to the human being. Whereas in chapter one, the animals were created prior to the human being. My, my text reads clearly, a helper, 18, a helper corresponding to him. Yes. If the man is worthy, the woman will be a helper. No, 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 wait, wait, Joe, Joe, you're reading commentary. We have to distinguish between the text and the commentary, okay? okay. Now, the, the commentaries, we'll talk about commentary in a moment, but for now, I'm just reading the text. The text, okay. without any commentary, is saying something very clear, that the human being, the man was created prior to animals, whereas in chapter one, the animals were created prior to the human being. Let's continue, okay? The animal's function in chapter one, right? What is the animal's function? At least it's stated explicitly and with regard to the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea, take a look at chapter 1, verse 22. Take a look at chapter 1, verse 22. What is the function, the role of the human being? Excuse me. No. Of the mm -hmm. What did God bless them and say? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the sea. Fertile, be fertile and increase. Fill the waters in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. In Hebrew, it's called pruuvu. 
okay, to be to be fertile and increase. That's a very important phrase that we'll discuss uh, extensively. Okay, this is a dominant theme in chapter one. So the function of the animal is to be fertile and increase. They have their own function, by the way, that's also the human function. How do I know? Take a look at verse 28. What did God say in verse 28? To the human being, be fertile and increase, fill the earth and master. Now we're going to talk about there's a difference in the function of the human being as opposed to the animals. We'll talk about that soon. But one thing is clear that the creatures of the earth have their own function. The animals are meant to be fertile and fill the earth, and the human beings there too. But in chapter two, remember we said what was the function of the animals? Not to be fertile and increase. What did we say the function of the animals was in chapter two? Adam was lonely. To, to, re, to alleviate his loneliness. Yes. Not to be fertile and increase. The cre they were created to alleviate his sense of loneliness. So not only is the sequence different, but the function is different. The human being, the animals in, ch in chapter two, were there in a response to the human being, somehow to alleviate his loneliness. It's true that that didn't work out in the end, but that was that was their function in the world. Okay, in relation to the human being. In other words, according to chapter two, the animals were created for the sake of the human being. But in chapter in chapter one, the animals were absolutely not created for the sake of the human being. How could I know that? How could I know that the animals are not created because, for the sake of Because the human being came after. Oh, no. Because the human being doesn't exist yet. Because the human mm -hmm. being doesn't exist yet. So you can't say the animals were created for the sake of the human being. They were given a divine function of being fertile and increasing before the human being came onto the scene. So not only is the sequence different, but the function is different. Okay, discrepancy number three. I'm not done, not even close. Okay, let's talk about the nature of the human being. Let's talk about what defined, defining characteristic of a human being. What would you say, what, before looking at the text, based on your knowledge, having studied this stuff before on some level, what would you say, the, the Bible tells us about what distinguishes human beings from other creatures of the world. Go ahead. I'm opening the floor. What makes us different from other creatures? We have a soul. Uh, we should master the, the, the universe or whatever. We have a but soul. Okay. We have a soul to Not distinguish some... between good and right. So... Okay. Interesting. The word soul is a very complex term. doesn't appear in the Torah. Not in the sense that it's used no. today. But that's a thought. Anyone that's not what goes into the nostril, the soul. Well, that's that's no? a mis it's a mistranslation. But Vera, you're along with millions of people who were <laughs> who have been who have been who have studied this text, in my opinion, incorrectly. But it's not your fault uh, because <laughs> translation translations are often problematic. But let me take a look at verse. You didn't get the what what I'm referring to in, in chapter one. Go back to chapter one and read, please. Read, please. Verse. 27, I'm sorry, read verse um, 27. Okay, what, what is verse What is verse 27 and 26? 26 and 27 in chapter one. What does it tell us about the unique quality that only human beings possess? What distinguishes human beings from other creatures according to this not the function, the defining characteristic of a human being in chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Look at it. You can read the text in English and tell me what it is. In God's image. Thank you very much, Terry. That is what the text tells us. Correct. Let's just read it. It appears twice. It says, verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Okay, and God created, next, next verse, I skipped a few words, and God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Okay. In other words, what the human being, what constitutes a human being, what distinguishes a human being, according to chapter one, is a certain divine-like quality that we all possess. Now, there's a lot of debate about what exactly that means. What is that feature that we possess? Is it intelligence? Is it free will? Is it creativity? There is a wide range of interpretations in terms of what that means to possess, to be to be created in the image of God. I don't want to get into the specific um, interpretation of that terminology, but I do want to highlight the very fact that the terminology that that whatever it is that we possess that's godlike within ourselves, it's it's a tremendous 
praise. It's it, it is there could be almost nothing could be said about human beings that's more flattering than the not from the Torah's point of view than the knowledge that we were created as 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 if we are we are God like. Um, it, I'm sorry. Rather obvious that after God said, "Let us make man in our image, after our likeness." They shall rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, etc., or and over the animal. It it seems to me obvious that man. The reason for that is that man has a higher degree of intelligence and oh, so, yes, and and, and, a, and the ability to rule uh, beings of some kind that are less that have less intelligence. That is definitely one interpretation of the terminology. But I'm not even going to get into, for, Joe, what but you said. Just, just at this point, what is another logical interpretation? Free will. Free will. Free will. Not necessarily intelligence, but free will. That we have the ability to choose between good and bad. We don't just follow our instincts. Or creativity itself. That we have the ability to create. That God creates. In other words, they're all related, but they're not identical with what the you birds said. Birds and animals also create. Well, again, is it a conscious creation? These, these are Joe. These are these are wonderful. What you're raising now are very important, uh, a very important issue, and it's one of those things that that has lent itself to many, many interpretations. Intelligence, what you said, Joe, is one. It's one of the interpretations of what it means to be in the image of God. I'm going to leave that on the side because my goal at this stage is not to, is not to focus on the meaning of the phrase as much on the, as much as on the phrase itself. The fact that we were created in the image of God, whatever that means, and Joe, I'm granting that what you said is one of the interpretations, right? The very fact that we created that we were created in the image of God is high praise. Is high praise. We can all agree that if God is declaring that we are create, God is declaring that He's creating human beings in His image. Then he's he's basically bestowing upon human beings the greatest honor imaginable, right? Okay. Why am I emphasizing this? Because if you look at chapter two, you're going to see something dramatically different. Let's take a look at chapter two. Okay. We actually read this verse before. Chapter two, verse seven. Let's read it in English. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth. He blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Let me ask you the following question. Does this talk about the human being as being created in the image of God? No, but he has a spark of God. That's what he... Not exactly. No, let's read the text carefully. Let's read the text carefully. <laughs> let's read the text. I, uh, Vera, I appreciate your what you're saying. But we're going to treat, try to read very, very carefully, trying to do without preconceived notions. The first thing the text tells us is that that he formed it from the dust of the earth. Okay, mean mm -hmm. By the way, what else was created from the earth? What else was created from the earth? The animals, the animals were created for before you get to the animals. In, right before you get to the animals. Verse 9, it says, From the ground, the Lord caused... I said, I, I'm sorry. The word in Hebrew is Adama. Okay? Um, in all cases. The English translation sometimes confuses. One says earth, one says ground. But the Hebrew is the same. Meaning, the, the human being was created from the ground. The plants were created. The trees were created from the ground. And in verse, yeah. in verse 19... Right? The animals were created from the ground, the earth, the ground. It's the same word in Hebrew, Adama. Meaning, if anything, the human being shares a common origin. A human being shares a common origin with the plants and the animals. They were all created from the ground. If chapter one is trying to highlight that which distinguishes the human being from all other animals, namely being created in the image of God, Chapter two is, is, if anything, it's showing that we are, our origins are the same as the, as the earth and as, as the plants and as the animals. We were all created from the ground. Yeah, now, but it's not completed. One second, one second. We're if we're created from the ground, but not with the same faculties. One no. second. We don't know anything about that. So the origins are the same. 
We yeah. are, we are, there is nothing here about cr being created in the image of God. Not only is there nothing, you're, th th these are two, contra these are two di di um, diametrically opposed concepts. One, chapter one, describes man as this lofty creature who is created in the image of God. He's a divine, like, he's a miniature God, a, a, a walking, talking, earthly God. But in chapter two, the human being is a lowly creature who was created from the ground just as plants, trees, and animals were created from the ground. So now you're going to ask me, so what distinguishes the human being from other creatures of the earth according to chapter two? If the human being, what? We're going back to the soul. It's written okay. soul in my book. You okay. write it as so, you said breath. So, so. But that's what differentiates. Okay, so that. zero. So oh. let's read let's read the JPS translation. The JPS okay. translation is the following. That you're absolutely right to highlight the, that second half of the verse. The first half of the verse sounds very much like the human being's origins are the same as the plants and the animals, right? The God formed man from the dust of the earth, from the earth, okay? The dust of the earth. That actually may be worse than just the earth, okay? But certainly not better than the earth, okay? So in what way is the human being special? So Vera, you're right to point to the, the continuation of the verse. Sure. What makes human being special? Not by his his essence. His his essence is the same as this plants, the trees, and the animals. What distinguishes him? He blew into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, your translation soul, unfortunately, I don't think is a literal translation. It's, you're probably reading Art Scroll or something comparable. Right. Awesome. Okay. And I would I would strongly advise against using the art scroll for, for this class or for any serious attempt to, to understand the literal meaning of the text because art scroll, I hope I'm not offending anybody here, but art scroll is a is an orthodox, I would say even a right-wing orthodox publication. It is it is very widely read because it's accessible, because it translates in very comprehensible English, not just Bible, but but text a lot of Jewish texts and they have a great marketing department and they've done a great job at making Jewish texts accessible. But what, 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 what they mean? have done, I'm sorry, I'm Wait, reading the, the Jewish publication society translation. This is a high quality, very seriously, a, a scholarly translation. I don't agree with everything here, but I certainly agree with most in this translation. Um, and this at least is done by serious Bible scholars and not by a group of Orthodox. Okay, let's just do it in English and Hebrew. I mean, what's the, the word in well, Hebrew? The, the word, the word Nishmat, the word um, Nishma. Nishmat Chayim is more Nishma. correctly translated as JPS is breath of life. Nishama, okay. Nishama means agree. life. It means so breath you, of life. Right. Perfect. In other words, Vayipach Be'apav, he blew into his mouth the breath of life. Now, what that means, and I'm going to give you a metaphor, which is not that far from the literal reading of the text. You ready for this? You all are familiar with literature and Disney. Okay. You've all, you've all watched or read Pinocchio. Okay. What is Pinocchio? Help me out here. Pinocchio is this wooden, right? Wooden uh, thing in the shape of a, well, like a puppet. puppet. And and then somehow Geppetto, I believe his name is, um, somehow, or the, the fairy, he creates this little puppet. It's a wooden puppet. And then this fairy gives him life. Now, just think of that imagery because it's very close to the imagery here. You have a piece of wood. In this case, not wood. You have dust of the earth. Inherently, it's nothing. It's just it's dust of the earth. What gave it life is God bestowed upon this by blowing into him. He blew into him life. In, inherently, it's just a piece dust of the earth. There's nothing inherently different from the human being than from the plants and the animals. What makes him different is that God, God blessed him or in, in, imbued him with breath, divine breath that gave him life. So he took this inanimate object, in this case, dust of the earth, and brought it to life. That's it. Okay, so what makes the human being special is not because he's inherently divine-like, as in chapter one, that his essence is divine, his essence is godly. What distinguishes the human being, according to chapter two, is that God invested 
in this little inanimate object, lowly creature, invested or, or, or beauty him with his breath of life and brought it to life, right? It's just a piece of wood, like a Pinocchio, or just it's just a blob of earth. It's a blob of earth, but God imbued upon him, right, his breath of life to bring this blob of earth to life. Now, what's the difference? The difference is that that chapter one describes the, the, the essence of a human being as godly. But chapter two is saying the essence of a human being is just earth. But what makes the human being special is the fact that God intervened, gave him life. In other words, chapter two was telling us that what makes the human being special is the fact that God created the human, made him a living being. He made him a living being, which means that that the, the God of chapter two is a God that that relates to his creation. It what gives la life and power and potency to his creation is the fact that God gave him life, right? In absence of God giving him life, he's just a piece of earth. No, right? or he would be an animal or vegetation. It's a being. Okay, he, it's, it's a divine, divine, divine breath. So it's well, no, divine. It's divine. But it's also, as, it could be divine, the same way that we characterize as an image of God. Here we are also an image of God because no, we have given no, no, no. a divine breath of Vera, life. Vera, it, it, no? I'm, trying, I'm, trying mean, to, I'm trying to make the point. There's a distinction between what defines a person's essence and what, the, right? Uh, That's the essence. Why wouldn't it be the essence? Because, 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 the essence. because in chapter one, right, God, that once God created a human being, that human being is a divine like creature, right? Yeah. But no, no, but it, 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 it's it's there's something about about the human being that by definition in in, in inherently is is divine like. The human being in chapter two is not inherently divine like. He's inherently nothing. He's inherently just the dust of the earth. But what gave him you what 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 makes him special and distinct from other creatures of the world is the fact that God invested. Blew his breath. In other words, it's the relationship between God and human being that makes the human being the human being and distinct from other creatures. Whereas in chapter one, it's not the relationship. The very essence of a human being is divine-like. That's a very important distinction I'm trying to make. You have to think about it before you can, I see if you're, you're it's, it takes time to sink in, but it's a very important distinction. One, the, the very essence of a human being is divine-like, whereas in chap chapter two, right, the very essence of a human being is just a blob of earth. But what makes him special is the fact that God gave him life. It's that relationship that's critical here in chapter two. Let's move on. The purpose of the human being in chapter so one. Before, yes, before Joe. You, before you move on. Yes. Aren't we trying to learn what the Bible says? Why, why are we arguing about different interpretations of what actually happened? It, uh, it should it shouldn't we both uh, pardon me for uh, being so blunt, but shouldn't we be learning about creation uh, all on the same page about actually what happened? Now the interpretations that's a different story, but but we're we, okay. but we're arguing about what one text says about. A specific thing and what another text says. I, Joe, Joe, I, I appreciate what the point of a whole lecture being on. Let's find the differences. Let's 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 learn about creation. And Joe, here's my answer to your question. I appreciate the question, and here's my answer. I, I'm going to say it. If I I was leading up to this. But I'm going to answer it in a nutshell, and I'm trying to. I'll try to prove it even further. Here it is, Joe. There is not one creation story in the Bible. There are two separate, to a great extent, contradictory creation stories in the Bible. I'm going to say this again. Your premise, the premise of your question, is let's learn the creation story. And what I'm trying to say, and I'm trying to convince you, I'm not the first person to say this by no means, that there are in fact two separate creation stories that the bible doesn't have one creation story it has two separate creation stories 
And in many respects, these creation stories contradict one another. In other words, we typically, why did I say, and I know, Joe, that why you're probably surprised by this, because you, along with billions of people over the years, have assumed that if the Bible starts with a creation story, there's one creation story. But what I'm trying to say and try to argue, and it's not an easy thing to accept if you've learned all your entire life that there's one creation story, the point I'm trying to make in this introductory lesson is that there are two separate creation stories that in many respects that is it contradict one another and i'm trying to show you how they contradict each other this is not commentary this is actually a careful reading of the text to show that there are two distinct competing creation stories in the very beginning of genesis we're going to talk about that as the course progresses that what is the significance of that it's tremendously significant in other words the torah from the very opening chapters of genesis is not telling us one story it's telling us Two. And By you're the way, tell us why. What? And you're going to tell us why there are two stories. Of course. But, but by the way, the title of my book and the title of this, well, it's not the title of the class, Discovering the Two Worldviews Hidden Within Genesis 1 through 11. I'm going to try to prove to you, I hope, Joe, I do hope that I will succeed in proving to you. I may not, and I respect that, Joe. I rem if, I'm, if you don't find my arguments convincing, then I will tip my hat and say, well, I appreciate you're coming to my class, and we'll part as friends. Okay. No, no. Okay. Now I understand. Okay. I understand. The, Fair enough. The, Fair enough. Not Bible everybody specifically says there are two. There are two stories here. There are two stories. Different stories. It, there are two different stories, and to a great extent, they contradict one another. And like I said, this is not com This is not the way the Bible is typically read, and that's why I wrote a book to say something different, okay? Now, again, I'm not the first person to say this, but I developed it in a way that most, further than most people do, but that give, give me some time to get there. Okay, okay, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm-, I'm well, No, don't, don't need to apologize. I, I'm saying something- I, I, I accept 100%, fine, go on. Great, it's Let's, great to have students who buy in. Okay, but I'm gonna continue with the buy-in. I hope I succeed in the little of the time that I have left. Okay, the purpose of the human being. The purpose of the human being in chapter one, we already said it, let's just read it in chapter one, the human being, if you look at chapter 1, verse 26 and verse 28, what was the function of the human being? We read it before, but just read it again. But I'm going to read it in English because we're running out of time. Um, just in English. God said, chapter 1, verse 26, oh. let us make man in our image after our likeness. They shall rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, the whole earth, and all the creeping things that creep on earth. So it's, it's that we should rule the animals, the whole earth, and the creeping things. Ver verse 12, verse, I'm sorry, verse 28, God bless them and God said to them, be fertile and increase, fill the earth and master it, rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the living things that creep on earth. So if I had to divide, right, the function of the human being into two categories, I would say there's the idea of filling, being fertile and increasing, filling the earth, and not just filling the earth, which, by the way, animals are also instructed to do, but unlike animals, we're also expected to master the earth, rule the fish, okay? Rule the earth, rule the animals. Again, the definition of ruling is, is requires some, some interpretation, which I don't want to go into, even though it's important, right? Ruling, right, I think, Joe, you referred to it, right, is exercising our intelligence, our free, whatever it is, to develop the world, etc. to develop the world, to expand upon the raw material of creation, Right, that's the probably the best way of reading it. Okay, so it's a certain the function that we're given in chapter one is is to fill the earth to, to to multiply to fill the earth and then to exercise control over it. But now let's read chapter number two. In chapter number two, what does it say? We are we already have referred to it. What does it say in chapter two? That the introduction in in verse we saw this in verse five. There was no vegetation in the earth. Be because there was no veg, nothing was growing because there was no there was no rain and there was no human being. The Hebrew adama. There was no human being to till the soil. So and then the next thing that happens is God creates the human being. So logically, what's the function of the human being? Hear me out here. To work. To work what? To work the earth. To work, to work the, the land. land. Now, let me, this is these are radically different visions of what the human being is meant to do, and not only radically different, they are radically different geographically, because to fill the earth and master it, which is what function of the human being, according to chapter one, where does that take place? Where do you fill the earth and master it? How do you do that? Where do you have to go? The land, to, I don't know. Where? All over the place. 
you, right. you, you spread your wings, right? And fill the earth with more humanity. That's how you fulfill your... But according to chapter two, they were not, the human being was not told to fill the earth and master it. He was told to, he was told to work the land, the ground, the soil. Where is the soil? Where is the soil? Where can the soil be found? Everywhere on the soil, on the earth. Starting with under your feet, starting with right yeah. here, right? You mm -hmm. don't, you, the only way to fill the earth, which is the mandate of chapter one, is to, is to travel, mm -hmm. is to expand mm -hmm. outward. But according to outward, it's, it's horizontal. But according to chapter two, it's it's vertical, down, right? By the way, there's a play on words here that is that is a very meaningful play on the words because Adam, and here I'm going to Hebrew, the word Adam sounds like another Hebrew word, which is Adama. Adama means earth, the soil, the ground. And it says very clearly, it says that in, in verse, verse um, seven, Adam is from Adama. The Adam, Adam, is from Adama, which means earth. So the human being's origins are from the earth, but its function is related to the earth as well. It's downward. Adama means his function is the soil that's underneath his feet or in his immediate proximity. Whereas in chapter one, his function is all over the earth, to fill the earth with human beings. Completely different vision of what human beings are expected. Let's move on. Next point. Let's talk about, this is fun. Men and women. Let's talk about men and women. By the way, Rabbi Fishman, we started late. Do, do Can I have a few extra minutes? Tell me when I have to finish. Go ahead. I, I, I think that this is a five-hour class, and I think we we'll <laughs> <be convinced. laughs> Well, you have to tell me a deadline, because I'm rushing. Take another, five, take another five minutes beyond, yes. Okay, so 8.05. So I'm giving myself five till 8.05. Okay, let's talk about, this is fun. Men and women. Okay, according to chapter one, what is the relationship between men and women? Well, I talked about I talked about human being, but what go 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 look at chapter one, right? What is the relationship between uh look at chapter one versus verse 26, okay, 26 and 27. What is the relationship between the man and the woman? Particularly verse 27, 28. Where it talks about the function of the human being. What's a relationship? Between? Is there, I'm going to give you a hint, is there a hierarchy in the relationship? Is there a hierarchy? Okay, here. How great to him, male and female, he created them. No. No. <laughs> What's the relationship between them? God created, God created. Both in the image. Both oh. of them. Both of them. God created. Okay, Zachar Unikiva translated, created them male and female. The human being is comprised of male and female. Okay, and they were both created in the image of God, and they were both assigned the task, right? God blessed them, and God said to them, be fertile and increase. Okay, etc. Mm -hmm. etc. Et God is speaking to them in plural, the male mm -hmm. and the female were created in the image of God together, right? And they were assigned the same task. And by the way, why is why is that necessarily the case that the human being that the man and the woman have to be together in this mission? Logically, help me out here. To multiply. To multiply. Because in order to in order to procreate, we all know we need male and female. So since the primary function here is pu or vu, is to is to procreate, you need to have man, male and female. Hence, they were created right as one. They were created together, and they have the same function in the world, which is to procreate and fill the earth. Human beings, men and women, are equal. It's a completely egalitarian vision of, of, uh, of the world, of the relationship between man and woman. Now let's go to chapter two. We've already said it, right? Is it is it egalitarian? Is chapter two, is the, the, the creation of man and woman in chapter two, is it egalitarian? No, because well, yeah, she was created from because, Adam. First mm -hmm. of all, the man was created first. Okay, mm -hmm. and then the woman was created from him, but not just from him. He was created from the earth, but not just from him, but, finish the sentence, not just from him, but. From his rib. What? From the rib. Not just from the rib, but else, not just his origins, but uh, not her origins, but her function. What is her function? Ah, loneliness. No. To relieve, the to relieve his from his loneliness. So the woman's function is related to the man. 
So they have different functions of the world. The man was created to work the ground, to work the, the soil, work the earth. The, the woman was created to alleviate man's loneliness. Now, by the way, I want to emphasize here, that doesn't necessarily mean that she's subsidiary, that she's secondary. Um, I, I don't have time to show you because there's only a four-part class, but but the, the idea, ezer, ezer kenegdo, which is the Hebrew word for a help meet. It's a bad translation, but there, there are a million translations here doesn't necessarily imply secondary status, right? Sometimes uh, help can imply, in fact, most cases in the, in the Bible, help refers to dependency, right? Most of the times in the Torah, in the Tanakh, where the word help implies, it refers to God, that God is our help. And so mm -hmm. to say that the woman is a help, is an ezer kenegdo, doesn't by any means suggest it's a secondary. But what it does say is that they had different functions. The human being's function is related to the ground, the soil, and her function is related to the man. And mm -hmm. so suddenly in chapter two, we do not have an egalitarian vision. We don't have a, let's put it that, let's use, let's take out the word egalitarian. We have different roles because egalitarian implies that she's secondary, that she's not important. No, she's very important, but it's different roles. And in, in chapter one, the man and the woman who created, right, with the exact same role, their origins are the same and their function is the same. But in chapter two, the origins of the man and woman are different, right? The man was created from the earth. The woman was created from the man's rib, and their function is different. The man was created from the earth in order to work the earth, and the woman was created from him to somehow serve or answer. I don't want the word serve because that implies secondary. To but, help him. Without her, she, he can't survive. So right, she's very right, exactly. Depend, to, uh -huh. to answer some kind of existential need for companionship. Okay? So it's different roles. There's very much a role-oriented universe in Chapter 2. Okay? Finally, finally... What is the name of God that appears in chapter one? Now you're going to need, in English it's one thing, but it's fine, even if you read the English. If chapter one, right, the name of God is consistently referred, God is referred to God. as what? God. 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 God, it's always God. In Hebrew, it's Elohim. In Hebrew, it's Elohim, right? Okay. All the way to the end of the first creation story, it's chapter two, verse, all the way till chapter uh, uh, chapter. 2 verse 3, which is the end of the first creation story, which is the end of Shabbat. Throughout this throughout this unit, God is referred to as Elohim. But in chapter 2, already from the middle of verse 4 of chapter 2, and all the way through, God is not referred to merely as God Elohim. He's referred to as go ahead. Hashem. Hashem. Well, you have no. JP. You have the Oh, uh, I have my okay, I have Hebrew. Hebrew. Right. All Hashem, whatever you want to call it. In Hebrew, it's Yudke Vavke, the name of God, Elohim. Yudke Vavke, Elohim. Um, the, the way the JPS translates is the Lord God. You want to call it Hashem. That's not, it doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that God is described, the, the, the title of God is different. Chapter one refers to God, G O D, and chapter two refers to Hashem, which is God's personal name. Now, now that's not random, that's not a coincidence because God, right, the, your Elohim is a very universal, abstract concept. Elohim, which is God, which is, is a very generic term. Now, it's true that, that the chapter one is referring to the God who created the world, but it's it's a very generic term, a very impersonal, very abstract, very, right, I, I would say even transcendent. But chapter two refers to God by his name. yud ke vav -ke, right, with, with which Art Scroll decided to translate Hashem. Well, there's good reason to translate it Hashem because it's God's name. The four letters yud kei vav kei, yud hei vav hei, are God's name. And so what that means is that by, by virtue of the fact that God is named yud kei vav kei, that his name appears, means that we're already talking about a different type of a God. We're talking about a God who is more personal, right? Whose personal identity, his connection, right, is already apparent. And by the way, we see that in the story. We see that in the story because God personally went down and blew his breath into the human being, right? And then when God saw that human being was alone, he then took an interest. He took an interest. He tried to resolve this problem by creating the animals. And when that didn't work, then he created the woman. God is a personal God. yud ke vav the Hashem, right, that appears in, or yud ke vav whatever translation they want to use, that appears in chapter two is a different God. Now, I don't mean he's a different God, but it's a different characterization of God. I'm not suggesting that these are different gods. I'm suggesting different characterizations of God. And chapter one intentionally uses Elohim, God, generic term, and chapter two invokes 
God's personal name, because what they're telling you is different qualities or different characteristics of God. So if I had to summarize, my time is running out. We have, and I believe, J Joe, I believe that I have, I'd like to believe that I have convinced you, at least to some extent, that we are, that the first two chapters of Genesis, a break sheet, tell us two completely different stories about creation. And the question is, what does all this mean? Where does this go? What's the message? Who cares? What's the Torah trying to convey? Well, there's this powerful, powerful message trying to convey, but I can't get into this because my time is out. My time <laughs> is up. Okay, but I hope that I've generated enough interest. Very, very good, and I thank you. You're welcome, Joe. I hope I have you on board, but even if you don't, well. You, you have know. me on board. All right. Work in progress. I'm glad to hear it. So I appreciate your time. We have a lot. Let me just tell you that that doing what I'm doing in four lessons is absurd. Okay. I'm actually teaching an entire year course in a women's, uh, a young women's uh, um, post high school program. I'm teaching this book over the course of a year. Um, and so it can be taught over the course of the year. We have four lessons, four classes. We're going to do our best to get the, 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 the core of the issue um, with your help. I look forward to it. I'm sorry. I look forward to it. All right. So we'll see you all next week. Amazing. Same time. Allow, allow me to take this opportunity to thank Rabbi Dr. Harbeta. That was a roller coaster. I don't know if your if your head is spinning right now. To Joe Terry Vera, Kolokavod to all of you. Well done. This was this was high level. This was fast. So a huge amount of information. You are following. You are asking questions. Without any patronizing whatsoever, I'm extremely proud of all of the students in today's class. Okay, we might be a small group, but this is a mighty group, and I'm extremely proud of you. As you can see, Rabbi Harbeta brings incredible power and freshness and inspiration to his teaching. And today was the introduction. We've finished almost on a cliffhanger. We've like reached the moment of, okay, you've convinced us there are different multiple stories in creation. And therefore, what does it teach us? So he's also a brilliant pedagogue because he's left us wanting more in yeah. the next a lot three, more. Yeah. a lot more. Yeah. So he's left us wanting more in the next three Mondays. We're going to pause Monday. here for today and we will look forward. Terry, do you have a question? You look like you wanted to say something. Well, we have this rally in Ottawa next Monday. That, oh, uh, the Canadian-wide rally. What, of us time, on buses at 9 what, time, what time will that be at? The well, buses, well, you have to travel. Nine, nine, nine and coming back at 6. Wow. Okay. Um, Because we're a small group, hang on one moment.